right, good morning everyone. So uh, last one today, which means we're going to finish up the course, but also, uh, of course, we're finishing up the ray tracing part that we started last time. So last time we talked about the basic idea, the basic uh, framework for ray tracing, how we can create rays and mathematically describe them. And then of course, how we can calculate intersections of our basic shapes, our basic objects like triangles, polygons and spheres with those rays. And uh, I shortly mentioned also the basic shading model that we had before. I didn't go into detail because it's the very same shading model that we used before for the projective methods. But then uh, I talked a little bit about more advanced shading techniques, which were uh, can be used in ray tracing to create some uh, nice realistic effects by extensions that uh, fit very natural into the general, into the basic framework uh, of ray tracing. So of course there are also techniques to make like shadows and refraction in projective methods, but uh, for the ray tracing it is the, the key is that it really fits nicely into the general framework of the approach. So today we're going to talk about uh, more advanced uh, ray tracing topics and the first one is related to the geometry that we use of the models that we have for ray tracing. I said that uh, in the projective methods we're very often just dealing with triangles because triangles are hardware supported and when we do the hardware, uh, uh, when we want to do it for example in relation to games with the projective methods then uh, speed is an important issue or one of the most important issues which is why we rely then on the hardware supported approaches. But if we do the, the, the ray tracing and if we implement it, of course, um, we can model everything with a triangle. For example, we had this uh, example with a circle. Yeah, assume this looks like a circle. Um, and then we said, of course, we can make triangles here to simulate a circle. And if we make those triangles small enough, then of course it will look like a real circle and we will not be able to judge the difference between a real circle that is drawn on a screen or hundreds of triangles that are drawn. But if we do, for example, then now in ray tracing an intersection test with a ray and we have hundreds of triangles to model that, that costs us a lot of calculation time. It would make, be much simpler if we can just really draw a sphere or a circle and then just make this one intersection test and uh, this is a little the, <clears throat> um, and, and of course we can do that. We know how to do the intersection with a circle. But for example, if we want to have more complex models, if we want to have, for example, an ellipse or a rotated ellipse, then of course we don't know how to do the intersection test with that. So we have to think about how can we make the intersection with a rotated uh, ellipse, for example, or we can use another method, which is called instancing which allows us to do all these intersection tests or reduce the intersection tests on more complex shapes to the intersection test of a more simple shape. And uh, the idea of instancing is, you remember we had the transformation matrices that allowed us to transform vectors and objects. And the idea, that's basically what we use for instancing. We use a simple shape to represent an object and then we use a transformation matrix to create a more, yeah, more advanced or a little different object that is a little more complicated mathematically if we model it directly, but we can simply produce it by just multiplying with a transformation matrix. So for example, if we have a circle here, we know how we can easily describe that by the, uh, by the two parameters, the center and the radius of it. And then by making a non-uniform scaling, we can make an ellipse out of it and then we have a uh, flying saucer model here. Then we can take that and do another scaling and get different models. So this is just a, a scaling and a translation of course because we move the object from here to here by just multiplying the points representing this object with a transformation matrix. If we also do a rotation, so this is translation and scaling and this is then uh, scaling translation and rotation and then we have these two models here. So we see here and we, we know from transformation matrices that we can combine all those single transformations into one matrix. So we just have to create one matrix to represent that other object. And that means we can just have a very simple shape and use that to create 
more complicated objects, we can also use that to just store the simple shape and instead of sh storing the more complicated objects, we just store the transformation matrices, which is probably not that uh, effective in this case here because uh, storing those transformation matrices also takes a lot of uh, storage but if you have more complex models or if you think about a whole fleet of flying saucers then of course uh, you can imagine that by this approach you can also save a lot of storage but most importantly this approach gives us an easy way to calculate the intersection of these more complex models with the uh, with array so for example if we do array tracing here we know how to calculate the intersection with two points but if we uh, 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 the intersection with a circle but we don't know how to calculate the intersection with a rotated ellipse so the idea is to just reduce it to this original object so let's go through a simple example to to see how this works we have an object for example a circle and we do a transformation with it by multiplying it with a matrix so we get a transformed object, a transformed version of the circle, for example, in this case, a rotated ellipse. And now we want to do ray tracing, so we shoot a ray in a certain direction. And then we see that it, or we want to see if it intersects with an object, for example, with this uh, rotated uh, and transformed object. So the ray is based on a line equation in parametric form. We have an i vector e or we have a support vector for the line which we choose the i vector. Then we have a direction vector on the line which we choose the vector from the i to the screen and that means we have here the i vector for t equals 0, the screen vector for t equals 1 and then we follow the ray for all values larger than 1. So this is a little confusing. The ray actually starts here of course at 0 but I made this dotted here to indicate that this is the direction vector and this is the value for t equals 1 and then we're looking into everything larger than 1 because the 1 value, the t equals 1 value is set in a way that it corresponds with the screen, with the viewing window and we want to see if it array intersects with any object behind the screen window. So to see that we want to calculate those two intersection values but of course we don't know how to calculate the intersection of array uh, or a line with an ellipse but we know how to calculate the intersection with a line and a sphere so what we do is we can say and and the important thing here is that intersections are preserved under simple under the basic transformation so if we do a basic transformation to an object uh, like uh, scaling rotating translating then the intersection points which those objects are transformed in a way that corresponds to the original image, uh, to the original intersection points. So if we do here, if we have the original image of the ray here, so if this is a ray that is based on a line L dash and calculate two intersection points and then do the transformation on the object but also on the ray, we get the same intersection points. So the relative distance between those points is the same and the relative position on the circle or the ellipse in this case is the same which also means if we do the reversed transformation we can get this line in the first place and that's the clue here we say we have a, an, uh, um, <coughs> we have a, an ellipse we have a ray we want to calculate the intersection we know how this ellipse is created by this circle here so we do the reverse transformation to the ray then we get this original version of the or a uh, related version of the ray in this original related to this original object. We calculate these two intersection points, so that is then p1 dash of t1, and this is uh, p2 dash of t2. Then, and then we just do we have these intersection points, and then we just multiply them with the matrix to get these two intersection points. So this is just the matrix multiplied with this intersection point P of T2. Now you might have noticed that I wrote here T2 and not T2 dash, although we have a different point here. But this is exactly, I, I did this uh, on purpose because this is actually a reason why we don't even have to do this calculation here because the uh, 
the, uh, uh, the intersections are preserved under the basic transformations, which also means that we have the same t value here. So if this is 0 and this is 1, then this is uh, 1, then this is probably, I don't know, let's say it's 2, because then it's easier to calculate. Then here, if we transform this, we probably have our image of the eye here, which means t is 0. The screen is somewhere here for t1. And here we have t2. So you see here that the relative distances are the same, which is why we have the same t value here. So we do not even have to calculate this. We can just take this t1 value that we get here. We don't even have to calculate the point. We just need to have this uh, parameter, the value for the parameter t, can put it in our line equation. So we put here t1, and then we get this point here, p1 of t1. So you see here that this is a very simple method to calculate this intersection points with a, a rather complex object that we don't actually know how to calculate the intersection by reducing it to an intersection test with a simpler model. Yeah. So, I mean, there are two ways to go back from the uh, first intersection point to the original intersection point. Uh, one is just to take the Yeah, there, there are two ways to calculate this original intersection point. There, there, the if you phrase it, there are two ways to go back. It sounds like it's uh, something something different, or uh, it doesn't matter. But it is uh, the point is. <coughs> oops, sorry. Here, you're calculating this intersection point. Uh, uh, <coughs> you say, we say this intersection point is basically the mirror of this one after the transformation. So we can say we calculate this intersection point, and then we do the transformation to come to the other intersection point, but because the t value is the same, we can use this line L dash to calculate the t value here and then just put the t value into this line here and get the same intersection point here. So it is the very same result but a different way to achieve it. Um, well in the second in the second case you just have to calculate the t value and put it in the line equation. In the other case, you have to calculate the original intersection point P1, multiply it with the matrix to get the other intersection point. That seems a little more complicated. Good. Yeah. So this is just the, the transcription of the approach, and you see here these two ways to, uh, to calculate it. All right. Uh, there is one thing, of course, you have to be careful, or two key things you have to be careful. Um, the first one is directly related to this uh, this here that I said that uh, the relative distances are preserved. But that is, of course, only true if you do not normalize the d vector, which, of course, we wouldn't do here anyhow because the d vector was the, the direction vector was chosen exactly in a way that it matches the distance between the eye and the screen because then we have this convenient situation that we have the, the t value starting at 1. <laughs> is behind uh, large values larger than one are behind the screen but uh, it is of course worse uh, important to to remember that because very often in this course i just said yeah we just normalize the vectors because then they have the length of one which makes usually the calculation easier in that case it doesn't make it easier it actually screws up the calculation the other thing we have to be careful about is also something we learned already in relation to the transformation matrices that we uh, when we do a transformation with the object, uh, and also we have to be careful that the normal vectors are not always preserved, especially in this case when we have a non-uniform scaling. I think you already had also had this in the in the first practical. If we have here our intersection point P2, and we have then the normal vector here, we can use that also to calculate a normal vector because it's easier to calculate a normal vector. On a, sphere, on a sphere than to calculate a normal vector on a rotated ellipse. But then if we do the transformation here of this normal vector, uh, and I call this n dash, to the normal vector n, we have to make sure that we use this matrix here, which is the 
transposed of the inverse of the matrix for this vector n, but for the point p we use uh, the matrix m. Or we don't use the matrix for p, we just calculate directly with t value. Good, so we see now that we uh, can use instancing to create more complex models or a little more advanced models than the basic shapes we had by, for example, just taking a circle and then uh, rotating and non-uniformly scaling it to get something like an ellipse, if you draw it more nicely than I do. Um, but also we might want to have, for example, objects like this one, and again, uh, like a ball here. And again, we could model this with triangles, but again, this would increase significantly the number of intersection tests we have to do. So uh, we're interested in a different way to, uh, in another way to transform geometric objects to create this more advanced shape. And we will do this by an approach called constructive solid ge geometry, which is a method to create more advanced shapes by basic shapes by using uh, set theory, theory. So I hope you are a little bit familiar with set theory, which is uh, at least the parts that we are using pretty simple. We have with set theory, you consider an object as a set of points, and then you use those set of points, you create new objects by doing modifications on those set of points, for example, by combining two sets, or in set theory, we call this a union. So we say the new shape is all the points of the old shapes combined. So here, we have, for example, a circle, so all the points that make up this circle are this set, and the new set is then the circle combined with all the points that make up this square, and then you see here we can have a shape that looks like I don't know what. Um, another set operation is the, um, the difference or exclusion, difference or exclusion, which is just all the points that are within one set but not in the other set. And we see, of course, here this here, the union is commutative, but the difference is not commutative. So if we say all points that are in the square but not in the circle, we get this shape. If we say all points that are in a circle but not in a square, we get this shape here. And again, uh, and of course, then, uh, and then you see this is something which uh, an operation with which we with would with which we could create this kind of shape here. Um, <clears throat> uh, alternatively, we can create this shape with the last uh, operation that we look into, which is the intersection, where we say the resulting object are all points that are in both original point sets which is again in this case this uh, ball shaped that we get um, so um, you see here we could get this shape here of a ball in which two ways with this set operations we could for example say we have a circle and then a square and then we make the uh, the difference and like here, circle minus square, and then we get, of course, we remove this upper part here, so we get our ball here. Alternatively, we could say we make the intersection of these two shapes if we place the square here, and then we could get the very same, well, now I've just drawn it the opposite way. If we make the uh, intersection, then this part gets removed and we get, again, this shape here. Of course, this part gets also removed if we make the intersection. Here we go. So, all right, yeah, so you see this, uh, this is a pretty simple way. Now, the question is, of course, how does, how can we calculate the intersections with the ray here? So, uh, don't confuse this intersection here which the intersection I mean when I talk about ray intersection. The ray intersection are these intersection points that we have if we shoot a ray towards this object, whereas here we're talking about the set-based intersection to create these objects. But this is exactly also how we can easily calculate the intersection points if we do ray tracing. Namely, we consider a ray 
also as an object, as a set of points, which are then just the points on the line. And then we calculate the intercept. We do apply the same set operations to the array that we use to create those objects. So for example, if we have here the square and we calculate the intersection of this points making up the square with the set of points making up the ray, then of course the result is exactly this set here in the middle that I didn't mark here. It's exactly this part of the line of the ray that is goes through the square. Likewise, we get this part here for the intersection of the ray and the circle. It's just this point set, this interval on the ray that goes through the circle. And of course, if we would calculate the intersection points or a way to get this interval is by calculating the intersection points with this simple object, which is in a circle or a, a square in this case. So the intersection, cal the calculation of this ray is quite simple. We just need these intersection points. The uh, question is now, of course, how do we get the intersection of these of the combined object and if we for example make the difference to get a shape like this like I don't know what this is called a pi or Pac-Man shape then uh, <coughs> uh, the, the clue is that we get these intersections by just applying the very same set operations because it's intuitively clear because we're looking at the ray now not as a ray but as a set of points and in the same way as before we had a two-dimensional shape with a with um, a circle and a square. Now we just have a one-dimensional shape, so we just have intervals, but we apply the same set operations and then you see that we get, of course, the same, uh, exactly those intersections that we would have if we apply it to this object that is created by the very same set operations. And then we just take these borders here of, the, of these intervals and then we have our intersection points. Good, yeah, and that basically explains what I just said. All right, so we see now we have two uh, uh, simple model, uh, simple approaches to create a little more complex models based on set operations or based on this uh, transformation matrix multiplication. And in both cases, we can very s easily and very simply calculate the intersection points by just doing what we have already learned. So. Um, <clears throat> This is, uh, 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 yeah, also I think it's, it's a nice uh, at the end of the course to have these approaches because you see that you, uh, it basically works with all the stuff that we have learned so far. There is not really much new that we had to learn in terms of the actual mathematics, um, but we could apply all the, the things that we used, for example, in relation to the projective methods. Now, the, uh, the ray tracing, I said last time, is for people who are more interested in game programming. They usually are not that interested in ray tracing because it is too slow for, for games. But uh, I, I also said that it is very uh, important for game programming in relation to, uh, I think in the book they call it picking which is you click on a screen and then you want to know at which object in 3D space are you pointing at or clicking at. And that is, of course, then the very same technique that you use for ray tracing when you shoot a ray towards a scene to see which pixel you have to draw on the screen. So this uh, technique of following a ray is also used in games, but especially in games and also in ray tracing because ray tracing is, like I said, very slow. Uh, we're interested in speeding it up and having it faster. Um, in fact, the, the ray tracing, the, the intersection test is the most critical bottleneck or the part of ray tracing that takes most of the time. So if we want to improve our speed for the ray tracing, this is the bottleneck. This is the problem where we have to first start with optimization. So we want to talk about a few approaches now to optimize and to speed up our intersection tests. And the first one is again something, or, uh, <clears throat> and that is uh, is applied, like I said, also for, for ray tracing, but it is also applied for projective methods for culling. So remember when we had uh, culling, we had uh, in projective methods, we had the view frustum, and then we said, okay, this is inside of the view frustum, so we draw this, but this is outside, so we do not draw these here. 
and here we are, have something that is partly inside, so we apply a clipping to these parts here, but only draw the parts that are inside. And here, of course, we have the same situation that we have an, a line, and then we want to decide which one is uh, outside or in. So we want to see which objects are hit by this and which are to the left and which are to the right. Uh, also collision detection, this is what in the book I think they called it uh, picking which is the thing that you need when you click on an object you want to know which uh, object are you hitting when you shoot array in that direction. Good. Yeah, and there are two uh, basic or two categories of uh, approaches. One is based on object partitioning, the other is on space partitioning. So let's look into object partitioning first because that is one that you uh, is quite similar to what we had with relation to rasterization. Remember when I, when I said we do the rasterization on the screen and we just have a triangle at a small part of the screen, there is no point in checking all the points if they are inside of the triangle or not, but we can just look around a small area around the triangle and the most simple area is of course a bounding box because we can get the bounding box very easily by uh, just using the, the minimum value, the minimum x and y value as the lower left of the polygon, of, of the vertices of the polygon, as the left bottom corner and the right top corner is then the uh, y max and x max value of those vertices. And then we have a bounding box, which is the smallest axis parallel box that fits uh, around the whole polygon or triangle or whatever shape we have. And uh, now, of course, the uh, it is clear if we check the object, this is the same that we had also in relation to, to culling, where we made uh, bounding spheres or bounding volumes in general. Uh, if we check if the ray intersects with this box, and we know the ray doesn't intersect with the box because the box contains the whole object, we know we don't have to do a detailed intersection test, for example, with these boxes here, because we know, oh, we, that's wrong. We have to check that one, because we see here so we see here that this intersects here and we see that this one intersects here so we're checking these two boxes and then in this case we see okay this polygon doesn't intersect although the box intersects so there is no thing here but so that was a, an unnecessary test but we're doing it to be careful because the box intersects so there is a chance that we we have an overlap here and in this case we then get the two exception uh, intersection points but we do not have to test these we just have to test the bounding box so uh, <clears throat> and to do this of course we need the intersection points of the bounding box or we need do not need the intersection points, but we need to know does the bounding box intersect or no. And uh, we can compute this very easily by just checking a, a simple condition. And uh, we see this um, if we, for example, so in the first step we just see if the ray intersects with each of the borders defining the bounding box. So for example, for the left side, the left border is if we do for a 2D case, it's a line and it is the line where we have x equals x min. Remember x min was the x value of the lower corner here. So this, it, this is the line that is the left border of our bounding box. And this is our array, how our array is defined. We have a support vector E and a direction vector D. And then for all t larger than one, we have to, uh, than zero, we have the ray. And if we say now the ray, the intersection point has to be on this line and on the ray. That means the x value of the ray. So the upper value here, x e plus t x d, has to be x min, because that is then this intersection point here. So by doing that, if we then change here the order, we come, we get exactly the t value tx min here that represents this one point here by this equation here. Likewise, we get, of course, the values for the other C and you see here for the other uh, uh, borders of the bounding box. And you see here, the only thing that changes is, of course, this, uh, this parameter here. Everything else stays the same because it's the same equation for the ray. Um, be careful here, this is under the assumption that 
the d vector, the x d, and also the y d are positive. So it makes it it means that the point the, uh, the ray is pointing to the top right, as I have illustrated here in that image. If it points to the left, which means the x d is negative, or if it points down which means that also the yd is negative, then we have to, we get different conditions here, but we're just looking into, into this case for now. Good, and then the question is of course, how does this help us to get the intersection points or to make a test if the ray intersects with the bounding box? And the answer to that is what we just heard, what you just heard a few minutes ago, namely this uh, constructive solid uh, geometry because if you look at the intervals x min to x max and y min to y max, those are basically just the two stripes that we have here. This was x min, this was x max, this is y max, and this is y min. So the intervals represent these two stripes here, and the intersection of them is of course just our bounding box. So if we shoot array now, we can do the intersection, we can calculate the intersection of the ray with this object, which is the set combination of these two stripes, by just calculating the intersection with each stripe and then applying the set operation to this to this uh, two intersections. So for example, in this case, we see the first intersection is here the intersection with the, the vertical stripe is here. That is, let's draw this again nicer. So the intersection with the horizontal stripe is here. The intersection with the vertical stripe is here. So you see here, this is the combined intersection of these two intersections and that overlaps, so we have it here inside. If it wouldn't overlap, for example, in this case here, we have an intersection here and here, then it doesn't over, the, the intersections don't overlap, which means that these intervals are not part of the uh, bounding box, which means the ray doesn't intersect with the bounding box. And we can check this overlap by just checking this simple condition here. We don't even have to calculate the intervals because if you look at these conditions here, we have the situation, if you think about, we shoot, we said we, we have only positive x uh, values for the direction vector, which means we're shooting the ray in this direction. And that means if it misses the bounding box, there are only two options. We can shoot it on this side, or we can shoot it on that side, or we can shoot it, of course, parallel to one of the sides. That's another option I forgot to mention, another special case we exclude for now. So. If we shoot it to that side, here we have x min, or here t x min are the t values that represent the values x on this axis, and here we have t y max. And this is exactly the case that if a point goes through x min but is also larger than this value here, it must be here on top and y max is smaller than x min, that means the intersection point must be here. So no matter where those points are, they must be to fulfill this condition in this upper square here. So this is the one case where the ray goes to the left or the upper side of the, uh, uh, misses the, the, the bounding box on this side. And this right side here is the case where the ray misses the bounding box on this side, because here we have x max, which is this one, is lower than y min, which is this one. And we see here that if that becomes higher, that means if it, or if it in the ray intersects with the bounding box, x max must become higher than y, uh, uh, y min, which means we just have to check this condition here and then we can be sure that the ray is below. Good, but again, this only works if we shoot the ray in this direction, if we shoot it in this, that or that direction, which means that uh, in this case one of the coordinates is negative, in this case both of the coordinates are negative, or if we shoot it in parallel to one of the axes, then these conditions do not apply, but we have similar conditions, so we just need to 
do a first check in which direction the, the ray goes and then we need to apply the right condition which is why I'm not bringing it here if you're interested you can look them up in the book or what I would also recommend is that you uh, actually try to write it down yourself and then look it up in the book if you're correct that's a, a good exercise good so uh, we see now that we can make these these bounding boxes to do simpler intersection to make the uh, to reduce the number of intersection tests but of course we can also extend this why do we just make one bounding box why can we not make more bounding boxes so think for example of a situation where you have a scene and you have a hundred models here and then you have a hundred models here then of course you would say it makes more sense or it makes sense to just have one bounding box around all those hundred models and one bounding box around around those hundred models because then you make first two checks and then if they intersect with either of the objects you can ignore the others complete uh, with either of the box you can ignore the other completely instead of checking two times 100 bounding boxes so depending on the scene it makes sense to combine multiple objects into one bounding box and then we can create and then of course within that bounding box once you hit that you can again then have smaller bounding boxes in there or smaller boxes volumes containing different objects until it goes down to the, the bounding box covering a single object and that way you get some sort of a hierarchical structuring of your space into bounding boxes containing different kinds of objects and this is here a simple example and when we do this kind of hierarchical bounding boxes we usually present them in a tree because that allows us to very easily then or efficiently do the calculations so we start by having the leaves in a tree where we have just the object the bounding boxes oh no the leaves in the tree are the objects and then the first level are just the bounding boxes around the objects indicated in red here in this image and then we combine certain objects together in another bounding box which is the green level in this case we have two here we also have two here we have three objects and then we make a larger bounding box around all the objects and that means of course if we shoot a ray now in this direction then we see there is no intersection with the yellow bounding box so there is no intersection with any objects within there so we can stop but if we shoot for example a ray in this direction then we see there is an intersection with the yellow bounding box so we have to check we have to go down our tree and check if there is an intersection with all the boxes within that bounding box and then we see that if this is let's say this is the first the second and the third child first second and third then we see of course there is no intersection with the first one so there is no need in checking the boxes inside of that box so we can stop here but we see there is an intersection with the second and the third one so we go we have to examine the child the children of these nodes so the bounding boxes are represented as nodes in our tree and then we see here there is no intersection with these two bounding boxes here so we don't have to examine those here but there is an intersection with this one so we have to check here if it intersects with the object which indeed it does so this is the leaf now the leaf is the object so we know there is an intersection with this object and in this case we have to check again those two bounding boxes this one intersects so we have to check that one this one doesn't intersect so we don't have to do a check with that object but we check this object and again we see it intersects so we see we have two intersections here and we have reduced the number of checks we had to do good um, yeah so this is just uh, some some comments of course on this hierarchical bounding box uh, creation um, that uh, of course the uh, the ray can hit, hit several subtrees like we've seen in the example the subtrees might also overlap so for example if we have another object here and we combine that then with these three then we have an overlap of the bounding boxes but that doesn't matter we just have to make sure that we go in each uh, subtree that overlaps and then uh, we will get the right result here good so we see here how come how we can further increase or decrease our intersection test by combining different objects in a bounding uh, in a bounding box but likewise we can also go the other way we can say if we have a more complex object like we had it with uh, we had the example with uh, the um, triangles when I said one of the motivations to apply this rasterization algorithm instead of just the bounding box test 
was uh, if we have something like this, then there is a lot of empty space here. So mapping uh, in relation to ray tracing, if we map a bounding box here, we get a lot of situations where we shoot a ray towards the box and it ba ba the ray intersects with the box, but it doesn't intersect with the actual object. So we have a lot of unnecessary tests. We call these tests usually a false positive because the intersection test with the bounding box was positive, but the intersection test with the object within the bounding box was negative. So it is first an alarm. There might be an intersection here, but then it was a false alarm because the intersection doesn't take place, which is why we call it a false positive. And this can, of course, happen very often if we have very uh, objects that don't fit very well into a bounding box. In that situation, it would be better to have, for example, several bounding boxes covering the object. Um, and this is, we, we had a similar, we talked about this in, in relation to culling again the, uh, before, that uh, the more our shape, our bounding volume matches our object, the less likely we have this false positive. Remember, we use the term conservative test in that context. Um, but um, of course, the more the bounding boxes match our object, the more complex does the calculation get and the more individual tests we have to do. So there is a trade-off here and also of course it is not straightforward how to do this. So it is very difficult to find the best way to separate or to do our bounding boxes in the right way. When I explain it I always talk about yeah think about a scene where you have a hundred objects there and a hundred objects there but uh, of course in practice you don't always uh, have such a nice uh, situation and then uh, deciding on what are the good bounding boxes to match here is of course a very hard problem. Good. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why we're also in practice often using other approaches which are space partitioning. So uh, the difference between the object and the space partitioning is that the objects, the, the object partitioning approaches partition the space based on the objects. So for example, for the bounding boxes, we had a situation that we could say we make a split here and here. And then you see here we have um, overlapping boxes here, but we can do test them individually. And if we have with one of them, we wouldn't have an intersection with the box. We don't have to test the objects. So this is uh, a partitioning approach based on the objects. There is also partition, uh, uh, other concepts which are based on the space partitioning and uh, that I will then talk about after the break. So let's make 15 minutes break now.